Good afternoon, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, let me congratulate the organizer, actually, for such a, a well-done job, because this is the largest crowd I see, and the largest crowd I see in a conference that stayed this late, actually, to listen to all of the uh, you know, talks. Um, I am always accused that I talk too much, so I'll try to be as brief, as precise as possible. I'll start with this story that uh, my brother always tells me. Uh, he, when I was around seven years of, uh, of uh, age, uh, I was in a men majlis, and he challenged me, and he said, if you stay and shut your mouth for five minutes, you get five dirhams. So and the, at the end of the talk, we see if I managed to get the five dirhams or no. Um, I have nothing to disclose uh, doing this strictly for uh, educational purposes. Um, as I promised that I'm going to go be precise, uh, drowning. Um, one of, uh, I did the, the whole presentation based on the questions I get from the resident, from the people, from the pediatrician, uh, when we are managing uh, patients with drowning. So try to be as simple as possible, and uh, to the point with uh, some evidence based of the new um, literature in this field. So the drowning definition in pediatric or in general has changed a little bit. Uh, so currently we are describing it as uh, the process that results in primary respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in a liquid medium. So this means that you go into the water, the water gets into your lungs and it causes problems. Um, an event in which the child's uh, airway is submerged in liquid uh, leading to an impairment of breathing is the other way to describe it. We no longer, and this is one of the new things, we no longer use um, the near drowning terminology, the silent drowning, the wet drowning versus the dry drowning, and all of this uh, has been removed to eliminate the confusion and because there was no kind of uh, physiological uh, logic behind it. <clears throat> also, we no longer classify them based on the salt and the fresh water kind of thing. Although I can see that in our area still it makes slightly different uh, if you are drowned in, uh, in a sea versus in the swimming pool. How common is this? Worldwide, we have a 7% of all injury related death is from drowning. There is around 370,000 uh, annual drowning deaths all over the world. And it is considered the third leading cause of unintentional injuries in children. And this is WHO uh, last statistics in 2016. Um, US, as we always take it as the lead in the field to see, um, you know, this, since they have more accurate or uh, more statistical data, uh, they get around uh, 3,500 or 3,500 um, fatal uh, unintentional drownings where, where are uh, non-boat relating, and 330 when it is boat relating. So those are the adolescents, as we come to see. Uh, it is interesting to see that for uh, every five uh, childs brought to their emergency uh, as a result of drowning, one of them died. That's in U.S. data again. 50% uh, of the people who are brought to the emergency that require either hospitalization or transfer to a higher level of care. Geographical uh, consideration, 91% of the death happens in the low and middle income countries, so in the underdeveloped or developing countries. <clears throat> the death rates is higher in the uh, African region. So when you compare it to UK, it's 10 times more. When you compare it to Germany, it's around 13 times more. Where do they drown, the children? <clears throat> this is important for all of us as being uh, you know, parents. So they can drown in sea or open uh, waters, we call it, open body of waters, like sea or lakes, in swimming pools, one of the common ones even here, in wells, buckles, bathtubs, and even in pounds, garden pounds, okay? In the high-income countries, it's more uh, in the swimming pools, while in the low- and middle-income uh, countries, it's more on the uh, open body of waters, like sea. Uh, probably you've heard about a lot of cases happening in UAE. The age, the two peak ages in children where they drown, 
the toddlers and the adolescents. The toddlers, because they become very curious, they start to be active, mobile, they go on chess things, try to, you know, uh, discover things around them so they can drown. And the adolescents, because this is where they start to have high-risk behavior, try to be, you know, the champions and so on. And in the West, because they get intoxicated. When you look at the male to female ratio, it is much higher in male, uh, it's 12 to one when you talk about uh, boat related drowning and around four to one in non boat related. So it's still very dominant in male. Um, I don't have a clear explanation for that other than the male are more risk behavior um, uh, in their nature. Uh, only in the bathtub, the, the girls predominance. Uh, the African-American uh, have a little bit lower rate uh, in North America. We think that this is because they have less pool access. Because if we think that swimming pool is the main source of drowning in uh, North America, for example, if you have less access to the pools or you don't have houses where they have pools, then your drowning rate is less. Uh, where do they drown? The infants can drown in the bathtubs. And uh, you might think, oh my God, do they really drown? Yes, they do. They slip out of the parents, uh, you know, for a reason or another, they sometimes are even forgotten. They left alone. If you are dealing with a primary mother who is an expert and um, doesn't know how to deal with children. Toddlers usually in swimming pool, while the adolescents, the natural open bodies of water. Okay, so in, in, in lakes, for example, or in the sea. Some of the risk factors that we always should consider is one, as we mentioned, the high risk uh, behaviors and intoxication. This is mainly in adolescents. And then certain uh, medical conditions like seizure. So those who are children that have seizure, we always remind the parents that they should not be left alone or unwitnessed when they are near any body of water, right? They have four times uh, more risk than the general population. Now, we always, when you see them in the emergency uh, department, you have to decide if they have a seizure, whether it was a child who actually had a seizure and drowned, or that they drowned and they had been in the water long enough that they now have CNS consequent, okay? So what happens when we, or the child drowns, when the water gets into the um, trachea on the lung? So the laryngospasm or the apnea and the pulmonary as aspiration leads to asphyxia, which in, 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 in its turn leads to hypercapnia and acidosis. This decreases the cardiac contractility. It eliminates the, or elevates, sorry, elevates the pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance, and it can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. Then there is... Uh, Abnormality in the, in the uh, surfactant function happens, um, which usually is depletion, so it's depleted because of the drowning, and it leads to capillary endothelial permeability to increase. This leads to intrapulmonary shunting and a VQ mismatch, and along with that, it will lead to poor lung compliance. Now, all of the things that we mentioned will lead to um, HIE, okay? So your risk of HIE or the child's risk of HIE uh, depends on or depends on increase if you have uh, a prolonged duration of untreated arrest, as we're going to come uh, later, the effectiveness of the initial CPR, and whether we are getting a secondary uh, cerebellar injuries after resuscitation. So that's where we come in as physicians that we can cause harm sometimes than benefit. So how do they present to our emergency? The majority will be asymptomatic. More than 80 to 85% of them will be asymptomatic. So they've been in the water, parents are scared, they bring them. Or they've been found in the water, they bring them to the emergency to be checked. If they are to present with symptoms, um, they can be uh, having uh, alternates in the, in the vital symptoms. So they're either hypothermic, they can have either of tachycardia and bradycardia, depends on how long have they have been under the water. Uh, they are usually anxious, both because they are scared and because they might have the CNS uh, consequently. And that's one of the things we need to differentiate when we see them. 
uh, they are, can be tachypnic and dyspneic. And if they are having any level of dyspnea, we should consider that they have been uh, drowned, and we take that actually serious. Then they can have uh, metabolic acidosis that leads to um, hyperventilation. And some of them can have the metabolic acidosis even if they are not showing other uh, symptoms or signs. Then they can be actually uh, presented with cardiac arrest. The cardiac arrest in cases of drowning, mainly or half of them or more than half is to asystole happening uh, basically from hypoxia. But some of them can have ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, so around 30%. And uh, I was surprised, actually, because I see a lot of them coming with bradycardia if they have prolonged enough. But it is less uh, in events when you look at the literature. The immersion syndrome, which is kind of when you are drowned and you come dead. Uh, it's a whole long terminology by itself that can be explained later. So what we should do for them, other than you know, taking the usual history in terms of all of the elements we talked about, where they have been, how long they have been under the water, who has been with them, any CPR has been initiated, and if it is, when did it is initiated, and so on. Um, we examine them, and then we ask for a certain investigation. So the reason I am putting it in one slide is just to tell you that we don't need to do much for every single case of drowning. I see a lot of my colleagues or many of my colleagues, any cases of drowning, they start throwing investigation on them. You don't need to do investigate everybody. We investigate those who are symptomatic only, and we can be precise about it. So if somebody is coming who is hypoxic and uh, hyperventilating or tachypneic, we need to see their blood gas because they might have metabolic acidosis, and we initiate our treatment based on that, right? We need the blood glucose because they can be hypoglycemic, and if they had a seizure, they can be hyperglycemic. Chest X-ray, I usually do if they are coughing, if they are dyspneic. One of uh, reason is you want something to compare when the prognosis happens later on. Uh, that initially, you might not see much if the child has milder symptoms or have not been underwater for a prolonged period of time. If they are having a bad X-ray, which is suggesting ARDS from the beginning, the outcome might be poor, actually. And then, if they have a seizure, or they had a seizure, they are comatose, um, they come with a rest, you need the electrolytes to see if there is any imbalance. And the lactate level will tell you how uh, bad they are in terms of acidosis and how long they have been under the water. And then you can consider C-spine X-ray and CT if you suspect that there was a trauma. Now, trauma led to the drowning or trauma happened because of the drowning. Usually when they go diving, the adolescents in particular, or that they hit, they bumped their head and they fell in the water. So management, that's the most important uh, part. But, uh, the most uh, recent that I have, and I did a lot of digging, couldn't find something very recent and new, although lots of reviews are there. But there was the panel of experts that uh, conveyed together in 2002 uh, and made some recommendations. So most of the changes that happened, happened after that. And I think I saw their advertisement that they are conveying in 2017 in, in Canada to revise all of the literature once again and see if they need to change any of their recommendations. But they had some priorities. They have like more than 17 things that uh, they recommended. I just picked up the one that I think is important. So the highest priority uh, to them is goes to the restoration of spontaneous circulation, because that can change the outcome. Then you need continuous, or they recommend continuous monitoring of the core and brain temperature. And they recommend that you actively warming the child if they are below 32 to 32, 34, and you don't exceed 34. So if the child have temperature more than 34, that's when you uh, start to cooling them down, and there are different methods that they recommend, and keep them cool uh, to around 12 to 24 hours after the presentation. So the goal will be to facilitate gas exchange, normalize the blood pressure, maintain good organ perfusion, and keep the temperature between 32 and 34. 
Um, many of these children, they will come to you or they come to our emergencies vomiting. So many people ask me what we should do. Should we suction? Should we, uh, you know, give something to stop the vomiting? Different and various questions. So it is very common. First, 86% or uh, more than 80% of them can come vomiting in a, uh, in a sort of another. What you need to do is the basic things. So you turn on the side. If you are in the hospital, you can suction. And if you are outside the hospital, you can just, just take the water away by you know, a cloth or putting them simply in the side. So we say that we want to prevent hypoxia that's, or manage the hypoxia very well. So we have two main things, or three. One, oxygen. All of them can get oxygen. It will not hurt if they are having any respiratory symptoms. Then you need to decide, do they, uh, can, do they need CPAP or do I need to intubate them? There are a couple of things that can help you with that. If they are not able to maintain their uh, partial uh, oxygen pressure um, uh, below or uh, around 70, uh, despite being on oxygen, if they have alter level of consciousness and able, unable to protect their airway, if the, they have high alveolar arterial uh, gradient, and if they have signs of respiratory failure in terms of uh, high PaCO2. This is when you decide or you're more likely needing uh, intubation, whether elective or imminent. Otherwise, they can go on CPAP if they are not maintaining or they're still uh, looking distressed on just a simple oxygen. So hypothermia for patients in coma. This is uh, supported by many recent uh, randomized control trials. Uh, you want to maintain the temperature between 32, 34 for 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the method is left to the institution to decide um, how you're going to do that. Now we know that when they are in, uh, you know, in places like Canada and uh, US, when they are submerged in a cold water, they can come with very, very low temperature. Uh, slowly rising it is of beneficial and they actually found to have a favorable outcome if they have directly emerged in a cold water. Uh, correct any volume depletion. So you give them fluids, and the best you give them is normal saline, despite what the electrolytes looks like. And then uh, pay attention to the acidosis if exists. You want to correct that by good ventilation and by giving the fluids. So many people ask, what about the steroids, barbiturates, nitric oxides, and vasopressin? None of them has been found to be uh, superior to just uh, placebo, or they are not having uh, good support that they change the outcome. Surfactant, we still don't have a conclusive data whether it is its routine use is of benefit or no. Usually it's used in the ICU, not in the emergency. So prognosis, prognosis. there is no particular uh, predictive factors, but generally it's related to the duration of submersion. The longer they are, the poorer outcome. So it's more than 25 minutes, very poor outcome. But they have good um, survival actually rate. They are better than other types of uh, cardiac arrest and CNS sequelae. I'm just going fast because of the time. Now, uh, disposition. So when we can discharge somebody from the emergency if they come. Usually we keep them six to eight hours. If they don't have a um, history of you know, prolonged immersion in the water, no evidence of other type of injuries, no change in mental status or behavior, no evidence of bronchospasm, tachypnea, or dyspnea, and there is uh, no evidence of inadequate uh, uh, oxygenation within this uh, six to eight hours, we can safely discharge them home. You, they, they don't need to stay in the hospital. Prevention, this is the last two slides. Uh, it's actually declined significantly over the last 20 years, but this data is from the developed countries. Uh, it's a very good area of prevention because 80% are preventable. It's age dependent. Mainly in younger, uh, younger children and infants, adult supervision is superior to anything else. In adolescents, avoiding intoxication and staying away from 
uh, the body of the water if they have to you know, drink or get intoxicated. The proper full fencing, like self-closing or uh, latching gate, reduces the incidence by around 50 to 80 percent. So it's highly recommended. The swimming lessons actually is non-conclusive. Many people recommended, uh, in particular, the European, but I didn't find that it actually makes a huge difference.